Hello everybody and welcome back on my channel. I've already compared the R7 with the R6 on a previous video, but this time I want to talk about the Canon model and the Sony A6600. They share a similar price and they have an APS-C sensor, so they are natural competitors. The R7 is more recent, it was announced in 2022, whereas the Sony was released in 2019, so there is a 3 years gap to take into account. I will also talk about the 6400 at the end of my review because it has many things in common with the 6600, but is less expensive to buy. Ready? Let's get started. Let's begin with the design and dimensions. They both offer a decent level of weather resistance, but the 6600 is lighter, smaller and slimmer. The R7 has a larger grip, which I find much more comfortable in everyday use, and even more so when you attach a medium-sized lens, not to mention a long telephoto lens. The grip on the Sony feels good enough when using small primes, but as soon as you work with a large zoom, the compact size can become a limiting factor. Keep in mind I have rather large hands, someone with smaller hands might find the A6600 more comfortable. In terms of physical controls, they both have two dials to change the exposure and various buttons located at the top and at the back. The R7 has an extra button at the front inside the autofocus minor focus switch. I find the controls on the Canon to be more precise and the buttons especially give you a better feedback. I also like the on-off switch that lets you go quickly to movie mode. What I personally don't like on the R7 is the autofocus joystick included in this large rear dial at the back. I try to get used to it and make it work, but I often touch one or the other accidentally. I can use the lock button to disable them, but then I have an extra step when I do need to change the settings. It's a compromise, I'm afraid, unless I disable the joystick entirely and use the four-way pad at the rear, but I prefer the joystick for its speed and precision when moving the focus point. Some dials on the Sony move a bit too freely, like the command wheel at the rear, and the movie recording button is small and located in an awkward position. However, I like the rear lever that allows you to assign two different settings to the same button. Also, all the controls are on the right side of the camera, which means you can use all of them with your right hand. On the R7, 12 buttons can be customized versus 10 on the 6600. These can be mapped separately for stills and video, in addition, both cameras offer a My Menu section where you can save your favorite settings, as well as a Quick Menu, called Function Menu on the Sony, that can be personalized as well. I find the main menu system to be more user-friendly on the Canon. The organization on the Sony one is more confusing. The two products have a similar viewfinder when it comes to specifications. They are decent and offer a smooth frame rate, which is nice, but they are definitely small and a bit outdated by today's standards. The biggest difference is the position. On the R7, the EVF is at the top of the camera, in the middle, which is the traditional position found on many mirrorless as well as most DSLRs. On the 6600, Sony placed the viewfinder on the top left corner of the camera, inside the main frame rather than sticking out on top. One solution or the other comes down to personal preferences. Myself, I cannot close my left eye, so I'm more comfortable with the R7 design. Moving on to the LCD screen, we find another important difference. The R7 has the common very angle LCD monitor that you can open on the side and flip 180 degrees. It offers more angles of orientation as well as more resolution. The Sony LCD has a tilting only mechanism but you can move it all the way up to 180 degrees, so filming yourself is still relatively easy. There are two downsides. A, a small part of the screen is covered by the viewfinder eye cap, and B, you cannot attach a microphone on the hot shoe when the screen is in that position. Both monitors offer touch capabilities, but that of the R7 is more complete. You can access the quick menu and the main menu. You can also take a picture by simply touching the screen or move the autofocus area. On the Sony, you are more limited. You cannot navigate the menu, but you can take a picture or start tracking a subject. You can also double tap to activate focus magnification. 
You can also use the rear monitor on both cameras as an autofocus pad while composing with the viewfinder. You can change the sensitivity as well as which portion of the screen remains active. I prefer the autofocus joystick for this, but since the A6000 doesn't have one, this option becomes an interesting substitute. The R7 can work with two SD UHS-2 cards, so you can use faster cards and backup while shooting, or separate the type of files. There is a dedicated compartment found on the side of the camera. The 6600 reminds us it is an older camera because it has one card slot, and it is UHS-1 compliant only. You need to access the card at the bottom, in the battery compartment, which is a less convenient design. One positive of the Sony is that it uses the same NP-FZ100 batteries as the S7 series, and that gives the camera excellent performance. You can easily go past 2500 images and still have a decent chunk of battery life left, and the R7 is on the same level for still photography. For video, I was able to record nearly 3 hours of 4K 25p footage at the maximum quality before the Sony battery ran out. The R7 managed 2 hours and 20 minutes, which is also a very good result. You can use a power bank to charge the battery or power the cameras. On the R7, make sure to use a high current charger, not every power bank will work. Also to note that if the cameras are turned on, they will receive power, but the battery won't be charged at the same time. To finish this chapter, let's talk about connectivity. The R7 has a microphone input, remote input, headphone output, a micro HDMI output, and a 10 gigabit per second USB-C port. The Sony has an older and slower micro USB port, the same HDMI type port, microphone input, and headphone output. The R7 and A6600 have an APS-C sensor, although the Canon version is slightly smaller. The R7 offers more resolution with 32 megapixel, whereas the A6000 model has 24 megapixel. Here you can see how the same scene looks on each camera when magnified 100%. With a good lens set at the optimal aperture, both cameras can capture a very good amount of details. Moving on to the dynamic range test, the two models are capable of preserving a similar amount of information in the highlights. If you open the shadows, however, the R7 produces more noise, and that becomes especially visible with an extreme four stops recovery. The normal ISO range is the same, but the 6600 has one extra step with the extended values. As expected, the R7 gives you more noise, and the difference starts to emerge from ISO 3200. The last test of this chapter analyzes skin tones, and what follows is also valid for video. When comparing the standard JPEG profile, the R7 has more yellow, whereas the A6600 has more red. The portrait style is distinctive on the Canon, with more contrast and even more red. That of the Sony has less color dominance, but it also looks more unnatural, with less smooth transitions between the different shades of colors on the skin and the lips. I find neutral to be the most balanced and accurate looking profile on the R7, whereas the Sony version has much less saturation. Keep in mind that these examples use the default setting for each profile. You can tweak them in camera by changing contrast, saturation, as well as the Y balance shift. And of course, you can work with the raw files and create your own look in post. The R7 features the latest autofocus system from Canon, the dual-pixel CMOS AF2, 
which works with phase detection on the entire sensor. The 6600 has a hybrid system with phase and contrast detection points. The R7 is more advanced with the software, especially with subject detection. It can recognize humans, animals, and vehicles. For each, it can identify different parts, body, face, and eyes for humans and animals, and the helmet for motorcycles and open cockpit racing cars. All this is valid for photo and video. The Sony can detect humans, but only face and eyes. Animal detection works with eyes only. The camera cannot recognize birds, and there is no option for vehicles. In movie mode, only the face and the eyes of humans can be detected. My eye autofocus test shows the R7 is superior. The Canon gave me a very good keeper rate of 87%. Only one photo was out of focus, while others lacked precision on the eyes of the subject. The 6600 couldn't keep up with the same performance, delivering a more disappointing 62% hit rate. There were more images out of focus as well as more images that were slightly soft. The same test with 4K video shows a more level performance. The R7 struggled a bit when the subject was turning on herself, whereas the Sony was a bit slow in correcting focus when she walked away from the camera. The Canon has a better low light rating, one stop and a half more sensitivity to be precise. My second test, done in very low light conditions, found a winner in the R7 once again. The keeper rate is only 48%, but the camera was capable of following the subject from start to finish. The Sony had a more difficult time tracking the subject from beginning to end, and in some moments it didn't even take the picture, which is why there are less photos. For video, the Canon did better in low light once again, whereas the Sony was slower in keeping the subject in focus during the walk and at the end when she stopped. Also to note that the 6000 was not capable of detecting the eye in these dim conditions, relying on phase detection only. So far, we've seen that the R7 has a better autofocus performance, but my birds in flight test gave me a different outcome. The best autofocus score I got with the R7 is 80%, but the performance was inconsistent. I couldn't replicate the same result on different days, despite using the same settings and lens, with the hit rate averaging between 72% and 75%. The camera can detect and lock on the bird really fast, but can also switch to the background or can struggle to correct focus quickly if the sequence starts with autofocus frames. The 6600 gave me a score of 85%, which is more than I was expecting. It didn't miss focus on the background as much, and was also a bit quicker in correcting focus in the middle of a sequence. It is fair to highlight that the Sony may have a better score, but the R7 is almost three times faster when it comes to continued shooting speed, and actually, this is the perfect time to introduce the next chapter. On paper, the R7 has some advantages. First, the shutter speed is one stop faster when using the mechanical shutter, or two stops faster when using the electronic shutter. And, if you really want to know, this is how each camera sounds when using the mechanical shutter. Then we have the continuous shooting speed. The R7 goes up to 15 frames per second with the mechanical shutter or 30 frames per second with the electronic shutter. The 6600 does a maximum of 11 frames per second. The electronic shutter offers a great boost in performance on the R7, but it comes with one major drawback. The sensor readout is slow. When panning, there is distortion and it becomes quite severe when moving quickly. As you can see, the Sony suffers from the same limitation. In many situations, the use of the electronic shutter on the Sony is redundant, unless you want to take advantage of the silent mode, of course, 
so you better stick with the mechanical shutter. The faster drive speed of the R7 can be tempting for sports and wildlife photographers, but unfortunately, rolling shutter can be very invasive on the background or even on the subject itself. In this example, you can notice how the tree and the hide behind the red kite are distorted. Here is a second example. Pay attention to the tractor at the bottom left. It is visibly distorted. Of course, you can stick with the mechanical shutter on the R7 and still get a more than decent speed to avoid the rolling shutter problem. The higher resolution on the sensor and the faster drive speed don't help the R7 when it comes to buffer. If you work at 30 frames per second, the camera slows down after just two seconds. You can double that by choosing the compressed raw option or lower the frame rate. The S6600 offers decent performance, but it's not outstanding considering the inferior frame rate and the lower megapixels. In fact, if we compare the faster speeds available with the mechanical shutter, the Canon does much better. Both cameras feature 5-axis in-body image stabilization. The R7 has a rating of 8 stops of compensation, although that can change depending on the lens used. In fact, the average is more between 7 and 6.5 stops. Still, the rating is higher than the one assigned to the Sony model. I did a basic handheld test to see how far I could go with slow shutter speeds on both cameras. The R7 managed to give me a few sharp shots at 1 second and Overall, the keeper rate was higher than the Sony. The latter only starts to give decent results from one fourth of a second. In video mode, the R7 delivers a smoother and more stable result, whereas the S6600 has more jerks and wobbles when walking. Now, I must say that the examples I just show you are not entirely fair, and I do apologize for this. With the R7, I use the RF 35mm 1.8, which has optical stabilization, and that means the camera combines sensor and optical stabilization to improve the performance. On the 6600, I use the 45mm 1.4 G Master, which doesn't have any stabilization. Unfortunately, I didn't have a Sony lens with optical stabilization available or a Canon lens with no stabilization, so it was either this or nothing. If I look at my experience over the years with Sony, I believe that a lens with optical stabilization would have not made a significant difference. Perhaps I would have been able to get a few decent results uh, around half a second, and maybe a better hit rate after that, but overall I think Canon still has the advantage here. Let's begin with a quick overview on the main characteristics for video. Up to 30 frames per second, both cameras record 4K with full pixel readout, the Canon oversamples from a 7K area, and the Sony from a 6K area, having less pixel to begin with. This, however, translates into a very small difference, and actually I find the Sony footage slightly sharper with the default profile and settings. To note that when selecting 30p, the Sony applies a 1.2 times sensor crop, whereas there is no crop on the Canon. If you want 4K 60p, you'll be out of luck with the Sony. The Canon does offer this possibility, albeit with a few catches. You can record with no sensor crop, but there is no oversampling. The camera does line skipping instead, which means it skips lines of pixels and delivers less sharp results or you can choose the 4K crop option, where the R7 records on a one-to-one -one area, but that comes with a heavy 1.8 times sensor crop. The ISO range is different from stills, as you can see. Like with the photo results, the R7 produces more noise, and that becomes noticeable from 3200 ISO and invasive from 12800 ISO.
Note that the Canon has a noise reduction setting that also works for video. It can help a little, but you also lose a bit of details in the process. The 6600 can record internally in 8-bit 420. The HDMI output doesn't give you much more, being limited to 8-bit 422. DR7 can record more color information with 10-bit 422 available internally on the SD card or via the HDMI port. Keep in mind this is valid only when selecting the HDR or log profiles. The 6600 has HLG and two log profiles, S-Log2 and S-Log3. S-Log2 produces darker shadows, whereas S-Log3 is more similar to the Canon Log3 profile in terms of latitude. The Sony produces more noise in the darker areas of the image, but is a bit stronger in the highlights. The E-mount camera includes Sony's picture profiles, a list of 10 presets that are entirely customizable and that includes advanced settings coming from the company's cinema cameras. This means you can tweak the image with much more precision, even though you're limited to 8-bit. The picture profiles also give you more dynamic range than the creative style setting, which is designed for JPEG still photos. Rolling shutter is bad on both cameras and the Sony does worse when panning quickly. On the R7, you can reduce it by shooting at 50 or 60p. Finally, neither camera has the 30-minute recording limitation. In my test, the R7 was able to record for 2 hours and 20 minutes without overheating. The 6600 did almost 3 hours. Both cameras offer a number of extra features. The 6600 doesn't go beyond things you come to expect nowadays, such as exposure bracketing or the time-lapse mode. The R7 has a bit more to offer, and I want to highlight two things. The first is focus bracketing and focus stacking, something that can be of interest for macro photographers. You can select various settings, such as the quantity of photos to take, as well as the focus increment between each shot. You can also stack all the frames automatically in camera rather than doing it in post. If you're careful in selecting a focus increment that is not too large, the result is very good. The second feature is raw burst mode, which includes the pre-shooting mode. The latter allows you to save approximately 15 frames before the shutter button is fully pressed, a helpful mode to capture fast action that is difficult to anticipate. This feature has two major limitations though. A, it works with the electronic shutter only, so we have the same rolling shutter problem mentioned before, and B, all the frames are saved into one big RAW file rather than individually. You can extract single RAW files, but only one by one, using either the camera or the Canon software. The 6600 is slightly more affordable than the R7 if we look at the body only and if we exclude temporary offers, cashbacks and other similar things. Obviously the Sony is older so you will have more chances to find it with various prices second hand. Another important point to talk about is the lens system. At the time of publishing this video, there are only two native APS-C lenses designed for the R7. If you want a faster aperture lens or anything else really, you have to look at other options. The first possibility is the EOS R full frame catalog. There is a decent selection of fast primes at an affordable price like the 16mm 2.8 or 50mm 1.8 to name a few, as well as one telephoto lens, the 100-400mm, that won't break the bank. Beyond those lenses though, the price can increase substantially if we're looking for high quality L lenses. At the moment, there is no support from third-party brands, Canon seems to want to keep the RF mount license for itself. The second possibility is to look at Canon DSLR lenses. You can buy the R7 bundle with the adapter for a little more money, and the EF mount range is much larger and more balanced when it comes to price and variety. Sony has a good catalog of APS-C lenses for E-mount, as well as an extensive list of full-frame lenses. 
There is plenty of support from other brands, including Sigma and Tamron, to name a few. There is an option for every need and budget. And on top of that, you can also adapt MADI DSLR and rangefinder lenses. Before heading to the conclusion, I wanted to share a bit of information about this 6400, because it has many things in common with the most expensive A6600. I tested the camera in the past, and actually I still have it today. I mainly use it to record part of my videos, more precisely all the shots where I showcase details about ergonomics, buttons, and so on. These are all the specs the two Sony cameras have in common, and that means same image quality, same autofocus performance, same video quality, and so on. The main things the A6400 is missing are the 5-axis sensor stabilization, the headphone output, and the larger battery. The grip is a bit smaller, and there is only one function button at the top. The autofocus performance is very, very similar, except for IAF that is not available in video mode. Compared to the Canon, the A6400 has more or less the same pro and cons we saw all along this review, except of course for the lack of 5-axis stabilization and a better battery life, which gives the R7 a bigger advantage in these two specific departments. But the A6400 has one major point in its favor, the price. It can be found for much less, and that makes it a great deal against the other two cameras. Alright, time to summarize everything I've said so far. DR7 is more recent, we can even say more modern if we look at certain features, and it certainly has advantages. The autofocus is better for the most part, it has a superior drive speed, although you have to be careful with rolling shutter, it can record video in 10 bit internally, it has a 4K 60p option, and the stabilization is more advanced. Concerning image quality, the Canon has more resolution, the Sony has better high ISO, so it really depends what aspect of image quality you give priority the most. I like the R7 design better overall, but I'm always surprised by how compact the A6000 series is, so once again it comes down to personal preferences and what kind of lens you're going to use. Speaking of lenses, this is where Sony has a big advantage. If you just look at native lenses, there is so much more choice for every budget and need. To be fair, the Canon RF system is younger, so it needs more time to catch up. And don't forget that if you have a limited budget, the 6400 shares most of the features found in the 6600, but for a much lower price. Right, that marks the end of the video then. Thank you for watching. As always, don't hesitate to leave a comment if you have any question. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Bye bye.